In this video, I will introduce the metric that will be used for evaluating the performance of the different trained policy models. The metric will allow us to objectively compare our different trained policies, as well as how they perform compared to the human expert driver. This metric is a key tool to help us train and test policies that will hopefully outperform the human expert driver. Towards the end of the video, I will show how to automate the metric calculation using a trained deep neural network. This is the ninth video in the overall project. The project is to build a deep learning Raspberry Pi controlled autonomous vehicle. The project will cover the system from end to end, from building the hardware, the base RC chassis, and attaching the Raspberry Pi and the associated electronics, and then getting it all working. It then works through the planning and development of the software that controls it all, as well as the training and the testing of various machine learning algorithms to see how well they go at line following. So. After training up a few autonomous driving policies, to the point where they could successfully lap the indoor track, I realised that I didn't have a simple, practical way of measuring how they actually performed. How to compare the policies? Was one policy better than the other? And by how much? How did they compare to me as the expert driver? In this video, I will start the process of finding a simple, objective way to compare the different policies. I'm guessing this will be a bit of a process. I'm sure my thinking will evolve as I dig further into the actual comparisons using the real data. So the target is to get a simple metric that will allow us to directly compare policies. The idea would be, after training a new policy, upload the policy to the vehicle and let it autonomously drive around the track a few times. The collected driving data the camera images and the steering and speed data could then be processed by some algorithm to spit out the metric values. These metrics give us the mechanism to compare objectively and easily what's good and what's not so good. So what criteria should we consider for evaluating the policies? Well, given that the overall project is to get the Raspberry Pi controlled vehicle to autonomously drive around the track, I think the top two characteristics that need to be covered include the accuracy. The vehicle firstly needs to be able to follow the track without drifting too much and definitely without crashing. And the more accurately it can follow the track, the better. And the speed. In this toy autonomous vehicle project, the vehicle is effectively racing around the track. So the higher the speed, or faster the lap times, the better. If we can combine these two together in a metric, we should have a good way of comparing the policies. But how to package them together to form the overall metric? Let's walk through each of these ideas and try and make them a little bit more concrete. For me, accuracy is the key characteristic. It would be great to see the vehicle drive around the track as if it were almost glued to the line, just like a slot car. So we are going to measure this using the images captured whilst driving. Let's walk through the logic. From each of the captured images, it's pretty easy to identify the piece of track that the vehicle is following. If the vehicle is doing a good job at following the line, then we'd expect that the main mass of the upcoming track would be sitting somewhere almost directly in front of the vehicle. What we can do, using some drawing tool, is to extract a mask for the track segment. Then, with a bit of code, determine the overall center of gravity of the mask. These steps basically give us a two number representation of the road segment, the X and Y coordinate of its center of gravity. From these numbers, it's pretty simple to get a representation for accuracy. I simply take the X coordinate and weight it with an inverted parabola. When the X coordinate of the center of gravity is near the center of the image, you get a weighting close to one, and it drops off symmetrically either side. So for this image, the center of gravity is very close to the center and gives a weighted output value of around 0.99. We simply use this value to measure the accuracy, and I call it a reward. 
So for us to get a good idea of the accuracy of a particular drive, the idea is to calculate the reward for each captured image. Following the same process, identify the mask, calculate the center of gravity, weight with the inverted parabola to give the per image rewards. You can then average the rewards across the whole drive to give you your accuracy metric. The closer to one, the better the drive. Note that this just outlines the logic of how to calculate the reward values. If you wanted to, you could manually process the images after each drive, but it probably would drive you nuts. At the end of this video, I'll go through the details of how to train a deep neural network to automate this processing. So this covers the accuracy, a single numerical average reward value. How to factor in the speed? Speed's an easy concept to understand. We all know what it means physically, and that the quicker it drives, the better the policy. We are already collecting speed as part of the training data. Well, strictly speaking, we are not actually measuring the speed. We are measuring or controlling the PWM pulses being sent to the motor. Hopefully, this is close enough to the speed. So how to incorporate this as part of the overall metric? Well, in these initial stages, I'm controlling the speed with the keyboard. So in general science terms, it's like an independent variable, one that we can control. So while we're setting the speed, the trained policy is making the decisions on the steering. And together, the vehicle hopefully drives around the track. In the example data shown here, the speed is incremented in steps to the point where the vehicle actually leaves the track. Now, if you look at the calculated reward values for this drive, you can clearly see the reward, and hence the accuracy, decreasing as the speed increases, which is not really surprising. The faster you drive, the more difficult it is to closely follow the track. So coming back to the question, how to incorporate speed into our overall metric? Well, given that we are controlling the speed as an independent variable, and the resulting reward values seem to vary as a function of speed, it makes sense to combine them as a set of values, the average reward as a function of speed, basically a reward versus speed curve. A policy that delivers higher average rewards across a reasonable speed range is probably a good policy. Okay, so let's test out these ideas. I'll run through our previously trained policy models to compare their accuracy versus speed metrics. So far, we have trained two drivable policy models. They use tweaks to the standard behavior cloning approach to achieve a broader range of input images for training. One used a weaving driving technique to generate some additional training images. The other used noise injection to collect some more diverse training images. And as a baseline for comparison, we have the human expert driver as another policy. So to collect the performance data, the process is basically the vehicle goes for a drive around the track using one of the trained policies or simply me, the expert driver. The collected images and speeds are fed into the trained neural network that calculates the reward values for each image. These reward values are then grouped by speed and the average reward values for each speed are calculated. So first up, I took control and went for a drive around the track. I simply drove around the track one direction, incrementing the speed every two laps. Then the collected data was fed through the neural network to calculate the metric data. So how did I go? Overall, I was kind of consistent, averaging around a 0.9 reward per image up to a speed of around 0.2, or 20%, after which things dropped off quite rapidly. I did have a bit of a dip at 0.18. I went wide on a corner. It's always fun to look at some of the captured images from the drive. The vehicle starts moving at a speed of 0.13. There were no real dramas at low speeds. I was able to consistently get the vehicle to closely follow the track. At a speed of 0.18, I misjudged slightly and went wide on the curve, but I recovered quickly.
but after reaching a speed of 0.21, I started making a few more mistakes. And put it straight into the wall when the speed hit 0.22. Note that I was manually incrementing the speed as I was driving, which did seem to impact my driving concentration. So I think for future drives, I will automate the speed increments, which will hopefully improve my driving consistency. So my human driving gives us a benchmark. Let's have a look at how the behavior cloning policies went. Firstly, the policy trained with some additional weaving driving data. The data shows that the accuracy was consistently less than what the human driver achieved. Looking at some of the camera images while driving, there does tend to be some weaving in the driving. It firstly understeers and goes wide on a corner, then kind of overcorrects. As the speed increases, it slowly gets wider on some of the curves, and eventually fails to take one of the turns. Same place that I went off. I suppose I was the instructor. Secondly, let's have a look at the policy trained with some additional noise injected training data. The performance was similar to the weaving policy, but maybe dropped off a little more quickly at higher speeds. Driving was also similar, going wide on most of the main curves as the speed increased. It possibly was a little less weaving than the previous policy, maybe, and eventually going off into the wall. Note that the data shown here is a little preliminary. So don't draw too many conclusions yet about the relative performance of the policies. In a future video, I will do a more thorough training and testing, and it will also include the dagger trained policy, which may make the competition a little more interesting. So keep your eyes out for the future policy showdown video. Now for those of you interested, I will dig into the details of how I trained a neural network model for estimating the reward metric. As we saw, the reward gives a measure of how well positioned the vehicle is with respect to the track. When the track is well centered in the image, you get a reward close to one, and it falls off gradually as it moves to the edges. The logic of how to calculate the reward is pretty straightforward, but it would be time consuming to have to manually do it on all of the captured images. Fortunately, a neural network with a bit of training is well suited to automating the calculations. Now, just to recap the logic for calculating the reward. Firstly, we need to identify the track in the image, from which we can generate a mask. From this, we can easily calculate the center of gravity for the shape. We could use this to go and calculate the reward, but in the actual implementation, I firstly divide the image into three horizontal zones and for each of the zones, calculate the centers of gravity. This gives us a set of six numbers that represent the track. With the current calculations, I am just considering the middle zone, as this is probably the most critical piece of track that we should be following. Passing this through the parabolic weighting, we get our reward. Now we could get a neural network to directly predict the reward. However, I will use it to predict the x and y coordinates of the centers of gravity. This gives some flexibility later, in that we can change the weighting function easily without having to retrain the model. And with the neural network, I found we can significantly improve the quality of the center of gravity estimates by making it multitask. We can get the neural network to also predict the mask image. So with the neural network, we are training it to predict both the mask and the centers of gravity. Then to get the actual reward value, all we do is pass the single center of gravity coordinate through the weighting, and we have the reward. For the neural network model, it takes the camera images as inputs. They are 368 by 640 pixel RGB images. And it outputs the centers of gravity, which is a set of six numbers and the mask, which is a lower resolution, 23 by 40 pixels, with a depth of 1. So it's a single number for each pixel in the mask. To process the images, I use my favorite dense net structure, 7 layers. 
the output is flattened and goes through a few fully connected dense layers to output the centers of gravity. Now for the mask, I tap off from one of the hidden layers in the dense net, pass it through a single convolutional layer with a sigmoid nonlinearity to give the output mask. Altogether, the model has around 47,000 trainable parameters. The reward neural network is trained using supervised learning, which means we need to create labels. The general label process is, firstly, grab some images from the policy training data. Use a labeling tool to mark out the track with a polygon. I actually like the VIA tool that runs in your browser. It's easy to use, simple and lightweight, and I can save the polygon data in a CSV file. Then, using some Python code, I turn the CSV polygon into a pixel mask. I use the Pillow Image and Image Draw modules, which allows you to directly draw the filled 2D polygon and convert it back into a NumPy array. And finally, you calculate the needed centers of gravity. I do this in two steps. Firstly, I create X and Y axis histograms by summing up the pixel values along the axes. Then it's easy to directly calculate the mean of the histograms with a normalized weighted sum. So far, the model has been trained on a bit over 300 images, and it seems to do quite well on the collected data. For training with the pixel mask, it's a good idea to roughly balance the positive and negative pixel count in the loss function. I use all the positive pixels from the track and sample the negative pixels from the other regions of the image. And for the overall training process, remember it's a cycle. Once you've trained the reward model, it's ready to use to evaluate the policies. But if you find during the evaluation that the reward model is not classifying some images very accurately, you can always add the problematic images into the training set and retrain the model. You can continue adding images until you are happy with the level of accuracy in the reward calculation. And how does the trained reward neural network perform? As you've already seen, it does a pretty good job at consistently predicting both the mask and the centers of gravity. So this metric and the trained reward neural network puts us in a great position to be able to train and then properly evaluate different policies. In the next video, I will look at a different approach to collecting training data for behavior cloning. The approach is called DAGA and was inspired by the underlying mathematics of the behavior cloning approach. If you want to follow the overall project, please hit the subscribe button and feel free to like or comment.